Hi, everyone. Hello again, and hello to those of you who joined us yesterday. Um, as some of you will know, I'm Amy Culverhouse, and I'm an account executive with BetterWorks. And we're excited to be sponsoring this second day as well um, on the subject of performance management today, which is a subject that's very close to our hearts. We all know the world of work has changed dramatically. There have been lots of speakers talking about this this week as well. And companies have more to consider when they are looking to retain top talent or even attract new talent from a competitive market. Um, employees are looking for an environment where they can work from home, yet still feel connected to the organization and feel part of something bigger. They want to get immediate feedback and be regularly coached, but they want this to be an easy experience and not an additional tax or burden. And they want to work for an organization with a culture of trust, transparency and collaboration and to really be empowered to drive their own performance. Uh, I know this because I speak to organizations every day that are feeling restricted by traditional antiquated compliance based processes. Um, the world has changed and so we need to change with it and for employees to thrive. A company really needs to implement a culture of ongoing conversations, check-ins and feedback so that challenges and risks can be identified early and employees need to feel in control of their own goals and feel empowered. Um, and they want to discuss growth and development more regularly. Yesterday, we spoke about employee experience and its impact on talent management. And I, I shared a quote or a statistic, I should say, that I'll share again. According to McKinsey, people who report having a positive employee experience have 16 times the engagement level of, an, of employees with a negative experience, and they are eight times more likely to want to stay at a company. So this all presents a huge opportunity for HR to reinvent the performance management process to really suit the needs of today's workers. So in today's session, you'll hear from a variety of speakers on just that subject. So firstly, we will hear from Jamie Aitken, who is VP of HR Transformation at BetterWorks, and she will talk about how to enable great performance. Then we will speak to Tamara Chandler, who is a partner at EY, and will speak on the subject of rethinking performance management for the new world at work. And then finally, of course, I'm sure many of you know the format of this by now, we'll have uh, a, a panel discussion on the subject of reimagining performance in remote and hybrid teams. And for that, we'll welcome back Jamie and Tamara, and we'll introduce you to Adeline Loy, Global Head of Integrated Leadership Development at Nestle. And then we will, of course, welcome back Bruce again right at the end, and he'll provide you with a demo, a sh very short demo of the BetterWorks platform. And this is really going to bring to life many of the components that we're talking about today and how BetterWorks can really help to enable a culture of continuous feedback, high performance, and really putting employees in the driver's seat. So if you'd like to learn more after the session today, please feel free to reach out with me on LinkedIn, or I'm sure Jamie and Bruce would be happy to connect with you as well, or you can get in touch on our website, which is betterworks.com. So I'd like to stress that we would love your questions. We had quite a few comments and questions yesterday in the chat, so please do keep them coming in. Um, we can save some for the panel at the end. And then there are materials on the handouts tab on the right hand side. So feel free to reference those and download those. There's a really interesting report on there that we conducted earlier this year, which is a global report on employees' intentions um, for the year ahead and, and what decisions they're making and what's driving those decisions. So first off, I'm delighted to introduce you to Jamie, um, VP of HR Transformation at BetterWorks. And Jamie's going to talk through for the next 20 minutes on how to enable great performance. So Jamie, I will pass over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm um, excited to be with you today. Uh, I um, am thrilled to be talking to you about a, a subject I'm very passionate about, which is how to make work better and specifically how to enable great performance. So just a little bit about me. I've been in HR for over 25 years. 
I've been I've led global transformation projects for big uh, organizations um, globally, multiple industries and sectors, and I've really always been drawn to the notion of change, innovation, and transformation. So. I will say to you that um, I think this is a really exciting time to be in HR, um, and we have a really interesting uh, and exciting task ahead of us as HR uh, people to drive the innovation that the business is looking to achieve. So let's just talk a little bit and, and sort of set the ground here. I think. I think none of this will be a surprise, but let's just set the ground. Why is it that traditional performance management fails? Well, it, we know that, I mean, nobody wakes up first thing in the morning and says, gosh, I'm so excited. Today is my performance review. That Nobody has said that ever. It's universally hated, not only by employees and managers, but I would argue also from an HR perspective. Um, it's backward looking in that we're setting goals once a year um, and then having conversations you know 12 months later to talk about how we achieve those goals when in fact we know even in just the last two and a half three years that goals change and we need to be a lot more agile and be able to pivot as situations marketplaces change so we don't need to be tied to static goals we also know that it is very labor intensive uh, in terms of a process. It takes a lot of time for managers. It sucks a lot of energy out of, out, out of the organization as a whole. And, and worst of all, it's perceived to be biased and at times punitive. Um, McKinsey came out with a, a paper a couple of weeks ago that said that um, when Adobe was looking to change their performance management and did a survey internally, 22% of their employees responded that their performance appraisal process made them actually shed tears. So I guess the, the question is, why are we doing this? And why are we doing it um, you know, with a process that's over 100 years old? And certainly there's a, an argument to be made that that kind of uh, disengagement or morale crushing experience has an impact on attrition um, and we know what the cost of that can be. 1.6 times is the general rule of thumb for replacing an employee. And if we have uh, somebody who doesn't walk with their feet and actually stays in the organization, but, it, but is no longer engaged, there's a cost associated with that as well. But imagine if you could flip things around and actually really challenge uh, to supercharge your workforce, develop talent and coach your managers, all the while making the process more efficient. That's what I want to talk to you about today. And I'm in the, the lucky role of being able to talk to, organize, to HR organizations every day. And certainly this is something that an awful lot of HR people are, are looking to do. And what I found over the, the course of at least 10 years as I've been working specifically with HR tech enabled transformation is that there's really four key areas that you really need to get right if you're looking to make this type of change in your organization. One is to have a business, business driven approach to performance enablement and I'll talk about each of these sections um, as we go through the presentation. The second is more about designing to deliver value to your employees and your organization. So here we're going to talk a little bit about becoming much more people centric when we're looking at designing our future state process as well. How do you support and sustain the change? And then finally, how do you measure success? So let's get started. I think one of the first challenges with a business uh, driven approach, and, and actually I'll give you an example here. This is Colgate Palmolive. Colgate Palmolive was actually uh, in an interesting situation because they were starting to see that there were a lot of startups and micro companies that were sort of eating away at their margins as they started developing, you know, um, garage, uh, garage band um, soap companies or toothpaste companies. And what they realized is, is that as an organization, Colgate Palmolive needed to get a lot more innovative. So in order to do that, 
HR response in connection with that business strategy was to figure out how can we move our company to be more innovative? How can we allow our organization and our employees to start exploring and being more courageous around innovation? So they nurtured from an HR perspective, they nurtured this, this notion by having a much more self-directed goal-oriented employee base who were much more invested in consistently meeting new innovative uh, ob ob object objectives. And so I think this is an area that HR really needs to, to pay attention to, because if you just go to uh, your board with a, pros a proposal to change something in HR, and you don't make the connection to what it is that your business is trying to achieve, then it very, it very much feels like it's just an HR initiative. And really to make it come alive for business alignment and support is that you make that connection for the business. So ask yourself the question, what is your company's primary business strategies over the next few years? And then therefore, what demands does that place on your workforce? What do, what do your employees need to stop, start and continue to do? And also ask your question, what are the capabilities that your talent needs to do to achieve those business objectives? And I think this is an area that we really need to pay more attention to in HR to develop that business acumen so that we're able to articulate why what we're doing in HR matters for the business. The second piece that I think is really interesting and, uh, you know, I would say we talk about people centric design ideas and, and methodologies. And it's certainly something that I've been doing an awful lot of work with our clients over, I would say the last five years, six years, is this notion of uh, applying design thinking principles to HR processes. Certainly we are starting to see, um, um, it's certainly from a marketing perspective, We've been doing an awful lot of work around the customer experience. And we talk about the employee experience and manager experience. I would argue that design thinking is a beautiful way of doing that kind of work and allowing our those key stakeholders into the, the room while we design future state processes. And I'll, I'll, I'll admit, you know, 20 years ago, I remember sitting in a conference room with a bunch of other HR colleagues while we designed yet another iteration of the performance management process. And then we left the room very proud of ourselves, sort of threw it over the fence to the rest of the organization. And frankly, we're a little baffled as to why it didn't get the adoption and, and enthusiasm from the rest of the organization. Um, and it was because we didn't ask the questions to the people we were actually going to be impacting. So I think design thinking is an area that is certainly becoming more and more common in HR. Um, I, I do feel that it's still, you know, a relatively new application. Um, but I would say don't be intimidated by the idea. And I purposely pulled a very scrappy graphic from the internet just to show you how accessible design thinking can be. Um, to you and your organization. And certainly if anybody's interested in exploring this particular topic on how to apply uh, design thinking as it relates to um, how, you, how you build it into your design process, I'd be happy to chat. Please link, uh, do a LinkedIn with me and I'll reach out to you. Uh, but really the notion is, you know, at its heart, it's putting yourself in the shoes of the very people that you're going to be impacting with any kind of future state process mapping that you're doing. So I really would encourage you to start thinking about um, design thinking as a way of uncovering and empathetically uncovering the needs, the desires, the motivations of your various stakeholder groups. I will say um, I've, I've done a little bit of work in this, as I said, over the last six years, and I can give you sort of a thematically what I've started to see or some of the the main elements that we discover when we do this kind of work with clients. From an employee perspective, what they're looking for is meaningful work. They need to understand how they are connected to the goals and the vision of the organization. They need to understand 
and have very clear expectations of what uh, they are being asked to do. Um, and it's really important that they understand how their contribution is helping move the business forward. They're also asking for strong connections. They want meaningful conversations and they want to be heard. They want to feel that they can trust that their manager has their back and is supporting them, not just in terms of the business goals, but also in terms of the professional and personal goals that they are setting uh, for themselves in their career. They want to have timely feedback and they appreciate having recognition. Um, they also want to make sure that there's fairness in their evaluations and they want to feel that they're being invested in, that they have the right tools, but they also have the right coaching and mentoring and development plans so that they can move forward in their journey. Managers are looking for slightly different things, although you will see that some themes will reemerge in different stakeholder groups. For managers, they want to build high performing teams. So again, they want to be able to align their team to a clear vision and have clear expectations. They want to be better supported. And I think this is one thing that is emerging more and more in the conversation is the notion of the manager experience, because we're really asking them to be the ambassadors of this kind of change. We're asking them to take on different skill set sets to become better coaches, to be stronger mentors, but they need to have the support that enables them to do that. Um, they need to be able to track progress. And of course, they want access to data and tools so that they can make sure that they are helping the folks that need help and that they're able, able to coach and mentor all of their team members um, along the way. What does, what does HR look for? Well, they want insights and advanced analytics. They want to understand how engagement is changing. Is productiv Where's productivity? Are there gaps in productivity? So that they can go in and, as a strategic partner, go in and help support areas of the business that perhaps need a little bit more support. And of course, they're interested in adoption adoption of the whole transformation uh, program, not just the technology, but also are people actually making the changes in behaviors and mindsets that are going to support what we've designed from a future state perspective. This next one is dear to my heart. I've been to many conferences of HR over the last few years, and it always seems to me that there is at least one, one session that is how to get your seat at the table. And I would challenge everybody on this call, just take your seat at the table. Um, the idea of innovation and transformation is in HR also helps us as HR people get unencumbered by all of the administrative and bureaucratic busy work and let us get into less reactive and more strategic um, business focused work. They also want the ability to track progress, of course, and key to this is that they want sustainable transformation. So we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but the notion of how is the change being consumed by the organization and how is innovation going to be consumed and sustained over time? And lastly, what we're when we're talking about the leader persona, we're talking about wanting insights and analytics. Obviously, they're very keen to that. They're also keen, just as managers are, about having high performing teams. And they want a partnership with the CHRO and the HR organization so that they're able to be able to identify quickly how the organization, if, needs, if the organization needs to pivot, having partnership with HR allows them to have the people in the organization pivot with them at the speed that they need to. And of course, they're also interested in sustainable transformation. So I think, you know, the last thing I'll say about this is it becomes very important from a future state design. Uh, I think the best ones I've seen when we do this type of work is that we're actually bringing in representatives from each of the different personas in the room with us. So it's not just an HR exercise, but we're actually involving the people um, that we're focused in on so that they are also have a voice in this. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the University of Phoenix, because I think they had a really interesting case study that is relevant here. Um, they had a change in leadership and they really needed 
they decided that they really needed to change their core values to one of transparency and trust. And there were an awful lot of different elements, including, by the way, uh, as it relates to transparency, uh, removing um, an elevator shaft that just took the executives up to a private um, um, enclave of executives. So transparency, they took both figuratively and li uh, literally uh, removing walls, et cetera. But they also moved into performance enablement as opposed to performance management. So they replaced it with what they call an everyday performance development program. So it was a shift away from a compliance mindset to one of enablement and it prioritized the needs of the both managers and employees by having a lot more conversations, having both structured and unstructured conversations, a lot more feedback and recognition. And what they saw was really telling. After three months, they saw participation in check-ins jump almost 90%. Well, what does that tell you? It certainly tells me that employees were hungry for this kind of engagement and connection. Um, that participation has, it has sustained for three years and counting. So it's not like it was a one hit wonder. This was something that certainly resonated with the employees and it had an, it, higher participation rates led to improved uh, results in both employee experience and employee trust. So it's, it's not magic science here. They did an incredibly great job around the change management, making sure that employees and managers had the tools that they needed to be able to enable this kind of, a, of an approach to performance enablement. Now let's talk just a bit about how to support and sustain change because I'm a, 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 a huge advocate around change management and where I've seen a lot of um, hiccups happen is when we think about a transformation project only as a technology project. And what I mean by that is the change management and communications and all of that sustainable, uh, all, all of that focus ends on the day that we go live or shortly thereafter. My argument is that's when the work starts. And certainly there's a lot of preparation that happens, but that you need to build your change program to as a sustainability um, exercise. What I mean by that is change doesn't just happen as you're in introducing technology. You need to be able to track that change over time and make sure that six months, nine months, a year, two years from now, you're actually seeing that kind of incremental change and adoption that happens over time. We can't assume that just because we tell people why we're changing and we train them on what that new behavior and mindset is, that that's going to magically uh, alter immediately everybody's behaviors. So I always counsel that you really need to have a program that identifies milestones over time of what that change is going to look like and put a stake in the ground that says six months from now, here's what we want to see in terms of the behaviors and activities that are supporting the transformation. And then by the way, here's at 18 months, how we want to see that have evolved so that over time we are building the strength and capability, that muscle and competency around the coaching, the mentoring, the comfort, the, the uh, confidence around having the kinds of conversations and feedback that we want our employees and managers to have. We need to give them time, but we need to hold them accountable. As importantly, we need to hold them accountable over time to those milestone changes as it relates to behaviors. So what, what can we do to get the team ready? Well, certainly we're going to collect input from relevant stakeholders my argument and bias, or at least my vote is certainly explore uh, design thinking as one way of getting that, but really have a listening strategy so that you can find that you have a true sense of what it is that's really getting in the way um, with your current process. Set goals and metrics for a successful implementation, but as I mentioned before, don't stop on the implementation of the technology. Prime your managers and employees for change. So you're telling them ahead of time and setting clear 
um, a, a roadmap for them so that they understand over time what is what the change is going to look like for them and to give them comfort that you're going to be supporting them throughout that process. Also showcase how this is going to be aligned with why this matters for the business and then use data during that post implementation to see how that adoption and consumption uh, of innovation is, is happening over time. And don't forget that there are many different ways to go through a change. And so, yes, there's going to be innovators and early consumers of your transformation that will be highly enthusiastic. Uh, make sure that you are showcasing those stories so that people understand that, yes, this is possible, but also understand there's going to be some late adopt adopters as well. So make sure that you're building into your change strategy, um, strategies for identifying um, ways to help enable all of those different uh, folks through the change. Um, and here's another piece that I think we miss in HR that I'd really like to spend a, a moment on. And I've, I've got a picture here of a sort of a classic steering committee. Um, what, I, what I would argue is that this needs to be built into your sustainability program. And what I mean by that is usually when we have a project, a transformation project, we will build a classic um, governance model around that project. And what I would argue is that this governance model needs to extend and, and exist well beyond the implementation so that you're constantly tracking how that transformation has happened over time and are you hitting the marks that you wanted to. Also, as new innovation comes into play and new ideas and new approaches come to play, do you have an, a way to feed that up through that same organization so that you're not being left behind? So, so the days of, oh my gosh, that was great, the transformation is over and done, are gone because transformation is happening uh, at a much faster rate now. So you need to build a sustainability structure so that you're constantly asking yourself, is this all we can do? Do we need to do more? Uh, so last piece here is about how to measure success. And we talked a little bit about this at the beginning. What we're hearing at BetterWorks in a lot of cases when we're talking about performance enablement, we're, we're, we're hearing some very, you know, some common themes here. One is we need to achieve organizational objectives. We need, in the case of uh, Palmolive, we need to ignite innovation. And we, we need to support a successful business transformation. Well, those relate to performance management or performance enablement by doing things like measuring employee engagement and retention over time. A leader and manager effectiveness. How are we doing in talent development and how is that increasing because of what we've done in performance enablement? Has our productivity and performance increased? And then specifically around the technology, um, how is our, have we received our ROI around the technology that we've uh, invested in and how is the user adoption over time? So specifically around BetterWorks and how we think about it, as you know, uh, BetterWorks, and as you've seen with uh, Bruce's incredible demo, we're focused on very specifically on enabling conversations, to have frequent conversations between employees and managers. We're, we're also looking for structured and unstructured feedback. We're looking to have transparent, flexible goals we are also making sure that we are keeping our finger on the pulse with uh, employee engagement and we have a, a calibration tool as well so that we're we're making sure that we're managing the talent and you know both in terms of our high performers but also maybe folks that are having a, a little bit of struggle we're making sure that we're paying attention to them as well um, and we're doing all of this in the flow of work, which is an area that I think is a game changer. Uh, no longer is, is it required that you have to log out of uh, whatever system you're working on in your everyday work, whether that be Outlook or Gmail uh, or Slack or Salesforce. 
uh, you can actually be doing, uh, you could be in your Outlook asking for feedback. You don't have to log off and, and sign into a, 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 a separate program. And in fact, that's, that's kind of an important also element to it is if you think about traditional performance management, employees really only engage um, in that process twice a year, you know, it, whether if they're having a mid-year review, maybe three times. Uh, what we see with BetterWorks is that on average, employees are interacting with the system in one way or another once every seven days. So the notion that we're sort of taking down the walls uh, and being much more transparent and in the flow of work also probably is very reflective of the fact that our adoption is so high. And we see that in terms of this is a study that we did with uh, our own customers to see how, in fact, the impacts happen when you have a holistic um, a recipe of both goals, conversations, and feedback. So the idea that having those check-ins and that feedback, those conversations and connections actually has an impact on productivity of, empo of employees is, is pretty impressive. And the other interesting thing, uh, we did a survey um, from <clears throat> 2,500 respondents, employees and managers, some of which were BetterWorks customers and some did not have BetterWorks. And what we, said, what we found was that with BetterWorks, we saw a 25% increase in employee uh, NPS, three times the employee satisfaction. And I think most critically, especially these days, 44% uh, more employees said that they were willing to go above and beyond. Well, that is, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, so um, I did also want to say uh, and, and invite you if you're interested in uh, a webinar we have coming up on December 6, which is called Doing the Work, How HR Can Lead the Way on DEI with Dr. Creary. I would highly encourage you to attend that. Um, and now I think I'm just going to go and see if there's any questions that I can address. There are, Jamie. I have taken note of them. So the chat was very active, which was great to see. So um, it seemed to be really resonating, some comments about how, how people were learning. So thank you for that. We'll address a couple of the questions. One of the questions that came in um, was, so somebody commented, it would be crucial for performance management to bring the best in an employee growth journey while focusing on both weaknesses and strengths accrued along the way, how would the evaluation exercise enhance trust and take into account business growth? So um, I guess that's referring to kind of the performance review and how we balance both pieces. Uh, well, the, great question. And I think, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways that I've seen it. Um, I think, I think part of part of the challenge is when you cloud those conversations. So having a specific conversation established that says, let's just talk about how you're doing right now. Where's where is that you aspire to do next? Uh, wh where is your next step? How can I help you as your manager? What's getting in your way? I think that's one conversation that you can have. The ability to have a separate conversation specifically about a particular project same kind of questions. How can I support? What's what are the challenges that you're facing? Is there something that I can do to help? I think they're different conversations. And if you're if you're setting up your future state process, you need to be able to have the flexibility to have both of those conversations, right? But I think the other piece to it is the more you have the conversations, the more normalized it is to have those conversations, if that makes sense. Um, and so, like, for example, um, I, was, I was talking last week at a conference and I said, you know, the thing is, I don't have a, an annual performance review with my husband, right? We don't sit down once a year and say, okay, how did we do this year and how did you do? No, we have constant conversations and I think it's much more uh, human to have 
the those frequent conversations because as you do so you get a lot more comfortable giving the type of feedback and support that is what humans do so i would say um that's sort of my answer it's a little bit of a roundabout way but i think being able to have more frequent conversations and separate those conversations out so that you really are spending the time um, and making sure that you're not just heavy handedly focused on one versus the other. Great, thank you. There were plenty more questions, but we'll save some for the panel discussion later. So one in particular that I would like to address later so all our panelists can have a think about it now was, um, was whether ratings still work for performance reviews so if we have time later we'll address that then but we do need to get on to the next um, presenter now but thank you jamie we'll see you again at the panel discussion later thank you okay well that was a very active chat so we love to see it so let's keep that up throughout the next session so i'd like to welcome on the stage uh, Tamara Chandler, partner at EY. Um, Tamara is going to talk to us about rethinking performance management for the new world of work. Good morning. Um, it's still early here and I'm only halfway through my first cup of coffee. So I hope everybody bears with me. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, it's morning here. I'm in the Pacific coast. Good afternoon to those joining us from Europe. Good evening, I guess, for anyone who's joining from Asia Pac. I wasn't able to listen to the whole presentation because that would have had me up way too early this morning, but I'm really excited to continue the conversation that you guys have been having about performance management. And what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about, um, for this session, performance management in the new world of work. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been doing this, uh, I've been in this space for a long time. Um, uh, my first book, How Performance Management is Killing Performance and What to Do About It, um, was published in 2016, but we started working on that book, you know, in early 2013, 2014, it was delayed in this publishment. And um, so I've been mucking around and boy, it has been a journey. And what I wanted to do this morning is just share a little bit more about what that journey has been like, sort of where we are today and um what things are, what, where I think things are headed as we go forward. So we're gonna talk about the state of things to say, hey, what is happening out there today, 2022 and 2022 in the world of at work or performance management? Let's take a moment and go back to some of the foundational pieces. If any of you have seen me present before, some of this will look like a little bit of a review, but maybe new to many of you. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the evolved thinking. So over this past decade, then what, what have we learned? What has changed in the way that we want to approach this? And then a few critical success comments. Like if you're going to go forward with really reimagining performance management, as I would say, rebooting it, what are some of the key things that are be crucial for success? And I'll tell you, this has been um, <laughs> lessons in the field, painful lessons in the field. So I want to be sharing some of that with you today. So let's start with just talking about the state of things. Um, my headline is, well, it's messy. It's it's messy out there. Um, if, if you've, you know, back in 2015, 2016, Josh Burson said, hey, you know, these are the days that everyone's going to reboot performance management. And yet, despite all that energy, despite all the conversations, despite the work that we've done for this past decade, um, this is still frankly true for most people is that most organizations, not only the employees in the organization, but the leaders and the HR um, leaders still really aren't very pleased with what's happening in the space of performance management. So I've been tracking data in this space for a long time. And um, pre-COVID, this was what we were seeing is that we still had about 72% of organizations were saying that they needed a reboot, that they still hadn't really modernized performance management in the way that um, they thought that it would really deliver on their expectations and the needs of their people. 
Gart Gartner has been doing similar data, and um, more recently, they're showing that you know 82% of leaders worldwide still aren't seeing that these methods are achieving what they want, and 62% say it's not keeping pace with business. So why, if we were going to reboot and reimagine all of this stuff back in 2015, 2016, are we still here with a process that most people universally dislike, and that still is not accomplishing the objectives? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But Here's what I know, because I have been tracking this data. What is holding people back? What is causing this inertia from us to do something that really is achieving those types of results that we were just talking about in that last session, where we're seeing people driving engagement, driving organizational performance, those types of things. Well, the first one that's dogging people, and this has to do with that question that was posed at the very end, is rewards without ratings. If you're truly going to modernize performance management, you are going to step away from ratings. I fundamentally believe this even after a decade of doing this work. So how then do we recognize reward and pay people if we don't have this numerical number that we're putting into our system and it's cranking out the answers that we need from a pay bonus compensation perspective? Um, I'm going to touch on that today. I'm, uh, in this presentation, we're going to go deep in that in my master class later this morning. The second thing that's holding people back is manager trust. The idea that if we sort of release a little bit of the control and policing of this process, can we trust our managers to really implement this process in a way that is, is intended and will have the types of results that we need? So we, we need to loosen control, but do we trust the managers to sort of pick up the ball and, and take a forward. And a couple of years ago, I was just thinking about this, uh, Mihai, um, when I was in, in Brussels at HR Congress in 2018, last time I know that I was physically with you all, um, I talked about the manager dilemma. We did a presentation there that talked about the problem we have is that we've elevated a lot of managers who are really good at their particular discipline and maybe not necessarily good in the people space of being able to take processes that may have a little more nuance, like a conversation-based performance management process and take it forward. So that's def definitely a key piece. And then we still are struggling with some executives to really let go of sort of the old ways that they've, uh, they've managed performance and, and move into something new. They're still, honestly, I think for a lot of leaders, the old processes worked for them, got them into leadership. They're less likely, less comfortable letting go of that with something new. So those are the three things that we continue to see holding organizations back from moving forward. So what am I seeing out there? To me, it's just this interesting tug of war that's happening in organizations. And I see this all the time of this debate between pay for performance and equitable rewards and ratings or no ratings. What do goals or priorities or OKRs look like? How rich are they? How simple are they? Are they cascaded? Are they not? So there's this huge debate that is happening. And that debate is sort of what creates that inertia. We, we don't tend to take a, a bold stance. We tend to often end up in the middle or we sort of compromise on a lot of things or we don't do anything. So this is what I see happening out there, unfortunately, in way too many organizations. And, and the other phenomenon that this creates, this sort of waiting, is that we see organizations going through a redesign multiple times. I can tell you I have more than... 10 clients probably in the past three years that I've gotten involved in. It's their third round, their second round. They're coming at it again because of all those compromises, because they didn't boldly go forward. Um, you know, <laughs> we don't see this, this um, we don't see the changes that we really want to see. So that's a bit about what I see out there. Now there is some, <laughs> some good news. If there's any kind of silver lining uh, to the pandemic, I guess, um, the pandemic sort of shined a big old spotlight on this and said, look, traditional performance management isn't working. We already knew that, but now it's like right in the center of the spotlight. It's not working. And it wasn't accomplishing the things we need to really connect people, to help them when we were physically disconnected, to have a process that works when I can't, can't lay eyes on you every day. Um, the refocus or the, the elevation of the focus on equity and inclusion has also started to kick up more dust in this space. And then we we'll talk a little bit more about that. Our reward strategies weren't matching the times. And yes, we're going to talk more about that, particularly this up in the next session. So there's, I've seen the, the pandemic actually free some HR leaders from that debate and allow them to move forward, which has been great. If you are still having some of these debates in this org in your organization, you know, hopefully some of what's been happening in the world will allow you to really move forward. So 
that's kind of where we are in the state of things. So I want to take a minute. Like I said, I know I'm hoping some of you have seen my stuff, read my stuff, heard me speak before. As I said, I've been out there for a decade doing this work. But if not, let's just take a moment and just kind of reground on a few of the of the foundations related to um, performance management and the reboot process. The good news is, as I said, that uh, my first book was published in 2016, and it is a the detailed methodology for how you reboot performance management. I want to share that with the world, and and it's about it's it's based on some really foundational uh, points of view and perspectives and frameworks, if you will, and those have held for the past decade. They have proven to be true. Um, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many skeptics I've had to deal with, and and they've helped. So I'm, I can probably say you can trust these as your foundational process. The first one is the idea of the three common goals. So way back when, when we first started doing this work, we wanted to clear about what is it that we're trying to accomplish with performance management. 95% of the organizations globally had a traditional performance management process when we started doing this work. What was it that they were trying to accomplish with that process? We're trying to develop people. How do we grow our future leaders? How do we it, to grow the skills and capabilities that we need? We're trying to reward equitably, not equally, but equitably. Are we paying people fairly and equitably for the works and the contribution and the role that they have within our organization? And lastly, a little bit, the new kid on the block is we're trying to drive organization performance. How are we aligning to the right work and moving forward in the way that we want? Um, these remain to be the three common goals of performance management. I say now every organization will have different weighting, different priority on these goals based on where you are, what agenda you've got, you know, based on the maturity of your organization. But these three goals will always be present. Now, I would I always joke that my, my grandma Edna would say, well, bless its heart because traditional performance management really failed and continues to fail on most of these goals, which is why when you go back and look at that data from Gartner, we're still seeing leaders and employees and everyone frustrated that this process isn't delivering on the expectations. Now, way back when, when we started this, the reason I got into this uh, writing game, I wasn't, I wasn't an author prior to this, was I had been asked to write a white paper for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on this process. And they were asking us specifically to answer the question of how is performance management driving performance? Well, interestingly, what we found was <laughs> that there really wasn't any evidence that it was. <clears throat> and in fact, what we were finding is more often than not, traditional performance management was driving disengagement. And what we all know as HR and people leaders is disengagement reduces performance. It doesn't elevate performance. So we really had a problem um, with this, uh, with our traditional approach to performance management, despite all of our best intentions and best effort. Now, this is what I call the first of the fatal flaws. I saw Mihai just posted the link to the eight. I'm not going to go through all of them today, but here are the eight fatal flaws of performance management. They, as I said, they have held of uh, what are the things that are holding us back, that this is, you know, that that if we go through an annual review process where we're rating and assessing people, that doesn't create conversation or trust or connection between leaders. We are, as we say in our feedback book, we are positively negative. We don't remember the good work and that brings this very negative process, negative conversation into our process. Um, the ratings, we can talk more about that in the conversation afterwards, but we are we are not machines. We are not, we cannot numerically rate on a five point, a seven point scale, people with fairness and equity. It's just not possible. We think we can, but we can't. Um, we have this problem where we focus way too much on the individual and we lose the team in it. We need to focus on teams and organizations and not purely on the individual. So these are all uh, core issues, uh, fatal flaws, and I apologize if you're hearing the dogs, um, that have held. <clears throat> Similarly, then we have the eight fundamental shifts that talk about what are the things that we knew we need to be doing to go forward? What are the shifts that uh, are going to take us forward? It's about giving employees um, more agency in this process. It's about shifting our focus from looking back to looking forward. It's about shifting from a pure performance process to a more growth process. We're going to talk about that. It's about bringing more voices in to create um, equity and fairness and 
frankly, insight and value in what people are sharing with us. So it's stepping away from uniformity. This is a huge one that I'm dealing with a, a lot of organizations on. Of we One size does not fit all. We need to create processes that have more flexibility, more optionality, that can flex to the huge range and diversity of roles and work and things that are all happening within um, the organization. Okay. Um, the third framework that is super important is what we call the six configuration categories. So on the front of my book, you'll see there's this big knot. And part of the problem with performance management is we tended to create it, we tended to address it as it's just one thing, but it's not one thing. It's six things as we've pulled it apart. It's how do we set goals? How do we align? It's feedback and performance insights. How do I know how I'm doing? How am I growing? How, what do you see me doing that are my strengths that I should take forward? It's how do I grow my career here? And how do I have experiences that help me grow my career here? And how do I get the coaching and the mentoring I need that helps me achieve my potential in the direction I want? How do I make the right talent decisions? This is not just pay and, and um, well, pay and rewards, but this is also about promotion and experiences and leadership and, and all those types of things that we're making when we're, when we're looking at talent decisions. And then of course, rewards and recognition. So how am I ensuring that I am rewarding equitably, that I am giving people um, the recognition they deserve for the contribution and the impact that they have. So these are all things that sit within this complexity of performance management. So we can't address them as a big ball. We have to start to pull them apart. And when we're doing the design work, thinking about, well, how do we address each one of these in a way that accomplishes those three common goals with the right priorities that meet our organization and delivers on the culture and experience and all those things that we want for our people. So that's the, that's the complexity of performance management. And this, and those are some of the key foundations that, um, that continue to hold. And that if you're doing this work, I, I hope you consider now, I always say there's not one right answer because every organization is different. And I will tell you, it's funny because when I do this work, people say, well, just give me the answer. And I, no, we always, every single, there's no cookie cutter here. Every single organization needs to look different because the organizations are different. We're all our own snowflakes. Are there things that are good practices or leading practices that I continue to see working? Yes. And so here I'm sharing a few of those types of things, looking across the six configuration categories. Um, you know, I, I, in the goals and alignment space, seeing things moving more towards team goals and stronger strategic alignment, um, moving more towards priorities, or I, I know our Better Works friends are talking about their um, you know, OKRs, the different methods that we might do this, but how do we keep those fresh, alive, um, more progress oriented rather than setting a big annual goal and going to the end of the year and going, why was that goal there? And then trying to assess that goal. Um, feedback and performance insights. This is, this is the space that is so important because if you did only one thing well, do this well. And um, we talk more about that in the feedback book. But how do we have conversations that are about our employees, that are about their growth, that are about their career, that are about their potential? And how do we have that in a lighter, more frequent way, but also that brings more voices again into that process where feedback is redefined as insights that helps all of us grow and go forward? Um, career and development planning, really giving a lot more tools and insights to our um, people so they can move forward and take ownership of their career, putting more mechanisms in place that that uh, allow for more mobility of talent. I think of it like a velocity of talent. Are you putting things in place that are going to help your talent move more, more effectively throughout the organization? Are we really, this gets back to the coaching piece, that are we really preparing managers and others for um, coaching people? How do they have those conversations? How do they pe help people grow? How do they create something that is a positive experience that keeps people engaged and excited about the work that they're doing? And that can pull in a lot more peer-based models and other things that we're using today. Talent decisions, we really like to step away from calibrations and move into what we call about talent talks. How do you start to have more conversations about your people that are creating decisions and outcomes that are actionable, that you're, that you're, that are collaborative and actionable amongst the peer group of managers. And they're taking those forward and people are, <clears throat> you know, nothing about me without me, that people are part of that process. And then rewards and recognition. 
Um, again, going to talk a lot more about this later, but this idea of pay for capabilities and reward for contribution, really reimagining rewards, and that has to be a key piece of this. Um, and recognition, if there's, so I said feedback, if, feedback, if you're going to do one thing, do that. The other thing that comes with that, because recognition is a type of feedback, is really amping up recognition within the organization. Sadly, when you look at the statistics, there's a huge number of people that say, I do not feel seen within my organization. People need to be seen. They need to know that we love them and we're thankful that they've shown up every day to do the work that they do. So those are some of the common um, foundations, those foundations of hell, that's some of the solutions and the designs we're thinking that we're seeing. But now the other thing I'd like to talk about is how is this thinking evolving and what are the things that I've learned as we've gone through this? And so here we go. Um, it's going to talk about greater focus is needed on fairness and equity, on the role of teams, and on growth. So these are my three like big learnings over the past 10 years and you know, we all learn, hopefully uh, continue and how feedback is a part of that. So fairness is vital. Um, we were talking about trust earlier. You have to have trust and you can't have trust if you don't have fairness. And so it's very important that when we think about our performance management process, we really need to take a step back and understand it from a fairness perspective. Um, we've been doing a lot more work looking at this and understanding in traditional performance management we frankly have a problem where we bake in a lot of bias throughout the process. And I can't, don't have time to go through this in detail, but we talk about things like um, you know, expectation setting. Well, all goals are not created equal. If the thing you're basing your performance on is purely someone's goals, then that's about how they set the goals. That's probably not about how they delivered the goals. So there's a lot of bias that starts from that very get-go and then flows throughout. We see a lot of feedback processes that are still anonymous or where the manager is triangulating the feedback that other people are sharing. That's not helpful and creates an uh, element of distrust. Calibrations, you know, why do we like to step away from those and move to talent talks? Because calibrations are rife with unchallenged assumptions and bias and agendas that come into those meetings. They don't, they often don't create the environment and the collaboration that you're really wanting to create. So we have to take a step back and Really, you know, if, you, if you're interested in this, go through your, your performance management process and start to think about where are those places that inequities or, or bias are able to kind of show up and what can you do to start to minimize that in your process. The other thing is teams. I've got completely convinced that we need to really dial down the focus on individuals and way dial up the focus on teams because we all work in teams. And what we know is high performing teams are what are really gonna elevate the um, performance of the organization. So we need to be thinking about how teams play a role in performance management. How do, they, how do we start to set more team-based goals where individuals can then set commitments to the team and, be, and have that more tighter connection with them? How do teams do feedback? Because we know that teams that share strength-based feedback six more, uh, six more times than those that don't way outperform um, the organization or the teams that, set the, that tend to be more negative or don't really share that kind of positive feedback. So we really need to turn up the volume on feedback and collaboration and the way that we help each other peer-to-peer, teammate-to-teammate, that can be such an essential part of our performance management process. And growth, we sometimes kind of let teams off the hook, but honestly, if we're trying to create experiences for our people, if they need skills or capabilities that they're trying to grow, we're best to do that, but in the team, teams themselves can craft those experiences. They can start to be more proactive in thinking about how do I help this person have that type of experience so they can grow that skill? Or I see this potential in this person, I'm gonna put them on that project so they get that opportunity to grow. So much of that can happen if we really focus that energy and sort of set those expectations at the team level. And then the last piece is growth. And this is probably my big, biggest aha. And as we, you know, if there's a third book in me, it's probably going to talk a lot about this piece is about shifting our focus from performance and balancing it now, or probably I would put growth a little more down to be very honest, putting a lot more focus on growth. How do we help our people grow? Because here's the weird conundrum or irony in this. If we focus on growth, our people will perform. 
So maybe if we could quit policing and assessing and evaluating and start supporting and lifting and inspiring, we could actually have more fun and grow the and you know grow our people and have the performance of the organization increase as well. Um, so here's the model that we're playing with. So rather than thinking about performance management as just performance, and I always say when I work with clients, let's rebrand it. Let's not call it performance management anymore. More, I mean, Allison call it performance enablement. It, uh, you know, we hear that one of performance enablement. A lot of different names that people are out there, but really, there's a way to really reimagine this and and put grow right in the center of it. So here's this model of grow and perform. And what you see is you see teams flowing around it and you see feedback flowing around it. And so to me, this is the new model of performance management. If it puts the growth of our people, the growth of our teams front and center, if we get clear on what performance means, if we have simple priorities, if we have clear OKRs, if we have performance that is witnessable and manageable, and we focus more on progress and commitment to the team and how that progress is driving us towards our larger, big, hairy, audacious goals, that's where we start to really get in this groove that we can create amazing experiences that don't start to feel like performance management anymore, but start to feel about how do we help this organization be the best it can possibly be? How do we help our people and our teams be the best they can be? How do they have more fun and achieve the potential that is inside of them? And to me, that's what this is about. And so I love this quote from Marshall Rosenberg that talks about how our tendency, and we all, particularly in Western cultures, grew up this way, is to overdo evaluation, which is this assessment and rating and all of that, and underdo observation. What do I see in you? How do I help you? How do I get things out of your way to help you grow? How do I help you um, by observing the strengths you have, the power you have, the things that you can take on that will take you to the next level? Okay, um, I, this is a quote from the feedback book, but one of the things that is imperative that we do if we're going to adopt this is really shift our mindset, particularly for those managers that we want to help be ready to coach and support, but really for all of us is this idea that it's, it's their future, it's our people's future, it's not our agenda, and if we lean into their future, that's going to drive our performance, that's going to drive our kinds of outcomes. So we need to increase fairness, we need to elevate teams, and we need to fuel growth. And again, the best way to do that is going to be through really great practices of feedback. This is thinking about fair, focused, and frequent feedback that is anchored in this new definition that we offer in our feedback book, clear and specific information that's sought with the sole sole intention of helping ourselves and others improve, grow, or advance. And if you can put feedback in the heart of all of that, you'll have amazing outcomes. I for CP and CEO did a killer study in late 2018 that looked at all the practices that people were doing in the performance management space. And their conclusion in the end was only one was driving notable uh, impact and measurable two times the types of outcomes, revenue, performance, profit, when you had a growth oriented feedback culture. So if you're gonna do one thing, <laughs> you know, do that feedback piece and throw a bunch of recognition in there. So to bring this to a close, here's the, here's the crucial commitments that I think organizations need to make if you truly want to reboot, if you truly want to reimagine performance management. Number one is trust. So we're on the same page here. We need to trust our people. We need to trust the process. So often when we get in those debates and we're in that tug of war, it's because we don't trust that our people will do the right thing. We don't trust that they will um, they'll take the right actions. So that has to start with trust. And Laura, who co-wrote the feedback book with me, she'll say Paul Zacks, her, her, uh, her uh, professor crush, he's written some amazing books on trust and, and literally looks at the levels of impact we can have when we create organizations with high trust. Um, the other commitment I ask of you is don't leave rewards out of this. I talked earlier about uh, the six configuration categories that we need to address uh, a fatal flaw in design is if you try to take rewards out of this. I've seen it happen multiple times. Well, the performance management lives under the talent team. Rewards lives over here. Never the two shall meet. That is a problem. You have to come together. You have to keep rewards in the conversation or you will not be successful. And 
we're going to talk later in the next session about getting real rewards and moving away from pay for performance, which I'll put in air quotes because I'll talk about why that is, and towards pay for capabilities and reward for contribution. And um, I don't have time, I don't think, to go into this, but we will be talking about this in the master class, the pay for capability reward for contribution idea. And cruising, cruising here. And my slides don't want to advance. And then my last, last piece, and this was what I closed my first book with, and it's still so, so important, is be courageous. Um, again, I think so often we fail because we, we sort of compromise. We don't make the bold moves. We don't take uh, the bull by the horns, I think I see uh, here, where we really make some bold decisions on how we do this process that puts our people at the heart of it, that trusts them, that supports and readies our managers for this role. We really need to be courageous as we go forward. So those are the three commitments I have for how we take this forward. Um, being courageous means that you need to be ready to defend against the naysayers. Um, they're still out there. There's a lot of them. There's still stuff published that um, will tell you things that I don't necessarily think are true. But put all that aside, defend against the naysayers, and keep your courage as you go forward. And these are really then the proven paths to success. Anchor in those foundations. Focus on fairness, growth, and teams with using feedback as that accelerator and make that commitment to begin with trust, reboot rewards, and go with courage. So there you go. Wow, thank you, Tamara. We had, again, lots of comments and questions going on. Um, so we have time for Great. one or two questions. I should mention, we've been um, at BetterWorks recommending and sharing your feedback book with, with a lot of clients and prospects, and it's been very popular. So. Um, so yeah, a really interesting. Thank you, Amy. Book. Recommend uh, you know everyone check that out today. Um, so a couple of questions before we get onto the panel. We have some great ones, so I want to make sure I get some of those asked. So there was a theme with a couple of questions about how you can how you can give managers the tools during an evaluation. Um, so that they're evaluating without bias and prejudice along the way. So how do you ensure that talent reviews are, are less biased? Um, there were a couple of <laughs> questions along that theme, if you could take yeah. that. Well, th there's only a few, there's, there's sort of two sort of things that we can do to minimize bias. Number one is the, and the most important is to bring in more voices. So we can't rely purely on the manager because that manager is always going to have just their point of view. And so, sources, bringing in more sources, crowdsourcing those perspectives, and that ties with this idea of starting to get feedback flowing throughout the year, is a great way to start to minimize the bias. In the talent reviews, of course, we can bring some of those voices in from peer managers if they have experiences with those people. But then the other thing is to really be anchoring on things that are witnessable, right? How do we have observable uh, definitions of what the skills or the capabilities that we need or observable definitions of what impact is? And so we need to move towards those things that we can see versus those things we feel. Because when we're in the feel space, we're usually in a wrong space as far as we're introducing bias positively or negatively about those individuals. So part of that is you pull apart performance and growth. Performance can become very clear about frequent light uh, priorities and progress that we can see and witness. And then growth becomes much more about conversations about careers. And so if we kind of pull those apart, in the way that we're thinking about them, we start to have a lot more fairness in our processes. Great, thank you. And we'll ask one more question before we move to the panel. Um, it's actually a, a more of a comment, but I'll, I'd welcome your thoughts on it. So um, somebody has asked here, it would be good to hear more on the performance review and compensation review link in the absence of ratings without ratings. One challenge could be executing pay increases behind closed doors 
without the employee knowing their perceived contribution and value. Um, so you might be recommending that they join your session later, but if you have <laughs> yeah. some comments on that, then uh, I think that would be helpful. There was lots on that in the chat. Yeah, well, number one, anytime you're behind closed doors, um, you're in trouble, right? So that's why I said earlier, nothing about me without me. People need to be part of the process. So yes, yeah, so we'll talk later about pay for capability, reward for contribution. I didn't have time to go into that. But the way that gets clear is pay for capability becomes a skills-based model that is aligned to the market. And so that can be extremely transparent to employees. You can do pay banding based on roles and where the person is and their progression against that role and what the skills and capabilities are against that role. That's when we get into a very fair and a much more effective base pay model. Then we need to define contribution within the organization and what that looks like. And that's a big part of what we're going to talk about in the master session. Great. We'll look forward to it. Thank you. And you'll be um, hanging around for the panel discussion. So we'll keep yes. you where you are and we'll welcome back Jamie. So Jamie, if you can come back on the stage. Um, and then I'd like to also welcome Adeline Loy, Global Head of Integrated Leadership Development at Nestle. So the panel discussion will be rethinking performance in remote and hybrid teams. And I'd like to start off, Adeline, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization, um, since Jamie and Tamara have already presented themselves. So we'll start with you, Adeline. Brilliant. I've been following both ladies with bated breath, so can't wait to hear more from them. Hi, everyone. Name's Adeline. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I head up integrated leadership development in Nestle globally. So that looks across all the five regions that we have. Yes, alluding to me, myself, have, having a hybrid and remote team and in the space of talent and also with the link on uh, l and uh, in the area of development for leadership. So that's me. Used to be a global deployment lead for the region of Asia, Oceania, Africa, with teams across the region as well. And they uh, are required uh, to enable their own performance. So this is a, a key passion topic of mine, that link between performance, enablement, and also leadership development and growth as a whole. Hi. Great, thank you. Nice to meet you. So we'll start with you, Adeline. And we heard Jamie and Tamara share earlier how organizations can start to rethink performance management and how they can really enable great performance. What new opportunities and challenges have you seen in this area at your organization? Or think... at another organization? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I, I... I think this is a great time to be having this conversation. Maybe five years ago, the things that we are trying to bring to the table would have been disregarded by some people in the business as this is too forward. But with what's happened in COVID, more and more we see the need to transition our entire process from a static goal cascade, this is how performance is being measured, to something very dynamic, two-way, not just top-down, but bottoms-up, where people are entrusted and enabled, and where that feedback and that check-in happen throughout. So I think we are in a very, very good space to put this to the agenda of the business table, because here's when our leaders are starting to knock on our doors and say, hey, help us, give us a solution. We've seen that in Nestle. Um, I, I shared about leading a cross-functional team. I had teams out of a shared services center, out of the IT organization, and as well out of the talent and learning space before COVID. So when uh, COVID hit, uh, when we were going through this, okay, what shall we do? How will we manage performance? How will we measure presence? This was a lot uh, to take from the teams that were already on hybrid and already on remote to say, hey, business, this works, we can do it. And it's about trust. I love how Tamara said it's, it's really about number one, it's all about trust. You don't need to measure someone clocking in and clocking out because you trust the people, you trust the process and you trust the outcomes. And I think it comes from a huge space of trust. And when we can leverage that trust in the organization, then things continue to head towards a good direction. Great, thank you. Uh, Jamie, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You obviously speak to organizations that, that we partner with and obviously the organizations you've been at in the past. Um, what have you seen in terms of opportunities and challenges in this space of late? 
I'm just going to um, echo a little bit uh, because this notion of trust is a is a is a, I think a really foundational piece. Um, when when I'm talking to HR organizations, one of the first questions I ask is, um, "Do you let your employees select their own photograph for their badge, for their you know lanyard badge?" And if the answer is absolutely not then I know we've got a little bit more work to do, right? <laughs> because if, if the, the, the idea is that there are, and there's a lot of telltale signs if there's trust in an organization or if there's not. And so the idea is that you, you have to, you have to, when you're working with HR, you need to figure out where is the culture at right now? And then don't make the assumption that uh, immediately everything will change, but don't get discouraged that it can't change. And so what I loved about what Tamara was talking about was this notion of courageousness. And I think right now is the time for HR truly to be courageous because we do have business leaders saying, what are we going to do? We understand what needs to be done. And this is not the time to be timid about, about that. Oh, sorry, I was on mute myself there, so <laughs> it's catching. Um, Tamara, we seem to have uh, entered along this subject of trust, which, which absolutely makes sense, um, given what we're talking about. How can organizations really begin to, to change their culture so that they have this more trusting environment um, where a more transparent and collaborative performance management program can thrive? Yeah, we... we um particularly in the feedback space, we talk a lot about mindset, methods, and muscle. And I think you have to address all three. You have to start with mindset. So it really is educating not just leaders, but the whole organization around sort of modern approaches to, to people and performance. And, you know, what does, what does growth mindset mean and what works and what doesn't? There actually, you actually, you have to give people insights and perspectives that help them shift their mindset. So that's yeah. one piece. Then you have to put in methods that actually reinforce it. And, you know, the, we talk about managers and their capability. If we can put more pro, you know, more content and methods in place that sort of help them, then that's a, that's an element. And then we've just got to build muscle and it, it's sort of holding each other to account, you know, and, and, um, being able, and that, that is sort of a self-fulfilling loop because you have to be able to have a trusting enough environment to hold one of your peers to account, but being able to start to say, hey, here's what I'm witnessing, here's what I'm seeing, I don't think we're living up to what our expectations were here, and um, just being able to start to become that type of a learning organization. When none of us are ever going to get this right, I always say in, in feedback, I'm still, I, I'm, I don't get it right many times, like this, this is a process we're all continuing to learn. Um, I have a, a story to add to that. I love that piece. If I could chip into what Tamara was saying, I think it's, it's really inspiring to hear you say, Tamara, about the mindset, the methods, and the muscles. Very often we think of one of the three, and that would be right. our silver bullet. And with that, we're going to do a cure-all. And very often we realize that, uh, you know, it's like going to the gym and exercising just one part of our body. <laughs> and then we realize, hey, you know, it's not going to work. I have to say, Amy, I mean, if you could shoot me uh, 20 over years ago, I came from the business. I was an engineer and then I was in commercial. I was absolutely so sure that it's all about the method because it's all about balance scorecard. We'll make sure we cascade and everyone to the T is held accountable. But hey, that's a very static way of doing it. And, and it really removes that whole mindset piece and the muscle piece that Tamra is sharing about. I, I love that piece on uh, mindset and growth where Tamra, you were wrapping up with last uh, in your session. And here's why in my current role, being both in the talent organization and the learning organization, I see it so powerful because in learning in the past, people will go like, okay, it's l and it's about, you know, uh, we all talk about the 70, 20, 10, but then we focus on the 10%, uh, you know, all those uh, all learning by self, all the uh, programs <laughs> so and, and, and when actually performance enablement, it's all about the 70%. It's about growth in work, 
growth through work. Mm -hmm. And because you're finding that passion in your work and growing in your work, you get so not just enabled, you get so engaged that you want to stay on, you want to keep contributing, you want to give the above and beyond. So I tell uh, the leaders and the managers, hey, performance enablement is your best tool for development if you use it right. And that then that whole piece about feedback comes in because that's that 20%, that coaching, uh, not just of one to another, but the team. The team holds each other accountable. And that's where uh, psychological safety comes about because you've got that two-way feedback. Exactly. I love that. Yeah, Jamie, we're singing off the like same page. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Tamara. I was going to say, Jamie, I think we lost you for a second there. Do we have you back now? Yeah. I think, can you, do, is my audio working? Yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Loud and clear. Sorry, I, I missed tell us part a story. Of, <laughs> I, missed, I missed part of the conversation. No, we were we were talking about trust, and I think you were, you said you'd had a story to share, but you might have lost the moment. So um, let me know if we should continue on to the to the next question. Well, I actually, you know, so I, I was uh, working at a large manufacturer, a global manufacturer, and they had a very serious problem with trust and lack thereof within the culture. And so we, we partnered with McKinsey and we built out a, a, a leadership program that specifically focused on how, um, how the managers, and here I'm talking about people who were supervisors of people who built airplanes and trains, right? And um, so the idea was how do you establish empathy and how do you start with yourself first? And so it was really transformational. Um, originally, it was planned to just go down to the VP level, but because there was so much appetite for it, um, and I was uh, pleased to say I was uh, a facilitator of this, that it went all the way down to um, you know, line managers in the plants. And the, the, the transformation that happened, because a lot of it was about being an empathetic leader, but also you know, the, the change starts with yourself, that kind of work uh, led to an absolute transformation. I mean, you think of walking through a factory and having people screaming at each other, which was the norm, uh, to a place where it was um, a very empathetic feedback coaching kind of environment. So I promise you, if you can go from screaming to conversations in a few short years, it is very possible to do this type of work. Don't think it's not. Yeah, and managers obviously have an important role to play in this, in this element of trust. So one of the questions that, that came up a few times was how do you really equip managers to, um, to really move towards a uh, a more transformative performance culture. So Tamara, perhaps um, you might have some advice around that. <laughs> well, we, we often talk about the three C's, clarity, capacity, and capability. And so uh, surprisingly, sadly, in many organizations, we haven't even been clear about what the expectations are for managers. What is it that we expect of them? What is their role in this process? So I think we have to start first with just being very clear about what those expectations are and then really rewarding and celebrating those managers that deliver against those expectations, um, making it something that's meaningful. Um, then, you know, you've got to make sure, secondly, there's capacity. And I've, I've got my partner, Laura Graylish in my head because she's like, every time we present on feedback, the, all the managers in the room go, oh my gosh, I don't have time for anything more. I can't take on anything more. And so, we, we need to really look at that and think about when we're clarifying those roles, do, do they have the space and the time to do this? And then finally, do they have the capability? Do, have we helped them build those skills and competencies and capabilities to have these types of conversations? And some of that starts with just giving them simple conversation guides and, and giving them a place to safe place to practice and do some of these things. And then Again, creating that environment that both Jamie and Adeline are talking about that that we can coach each other, that we can that because peer managers, if you can create the right culture, can really feed off of each other, and that can become your seventy percent space where you're really learning together. Um, so those are the things that I think we need to address. But often we we sort of fail at all three. We aren't clear. We don't give them the space, and we don't help them succeed. Adeline, how have you gone about this within your organization? 
No, resonating all the way. I, I, one of the key things that um, <laughs> my team and I have done was really along the lines of clarity because we realized that we're asking a lot of people managers and sometimes they don't have clarity and they don't have capacity. And I'm using Tamara's words because the role of people managers have changed. If you think about it in the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, more and more, we are seeing the need to create that space for performance to happen than using a whip. Uh, thank God we, we, we've moved uh, to, to this phase in our lives. So within Nestle, one of the key things we've done about two and a half years ago was to talk about creating very clear perform uh, some we call it even performance consulting clear guides on just this is your role as a line manager it's a simple toolkit we even call it a vending machine these are just your one-on-ones and they're here they they help you with the very basics and then we move uh, to something that we call practice labs this is what we spoke about that safe space for practice it's a skill coaching is a skill feedback is a skill and the more we do it in a good reflective way, getting feedback as we do it, the better we become and the more confident we are to use that skill. And finally, one of the key things we've done is to personalize that journey. So with all first time people managers in Nestle, we've made something available, which is a day in the life, somewhat of a development center simulation arrangement where he or she goes through a very stretched day in their life, but then it's not driven by HR only, it's partnered by the business. So they bring a buddy who's from the business with them, someone who has skin, skin in the game for them to succeed. So beyond going through having performance consulting, those guides, beyond the practice labs, they also go through that full immersion and then they get to practice in a very safe space with a buddy who's cheering them on and want them to succeed. And then that buddy together with someone from HR gives observations. And that's being recorded while they're going through that simulation and they watch it themselves because we have that double loop of reflection. And we've seen that line managers who have gone through this as part of that transition program become much better coaches, become much better feedback givers, become much better performance enablers than those who have not. Wow, amazing to hear Adeline, the work that you've been doing over there. Jamie, what, how did the, the frontline workers kind of react? How did the, the managers react when this change started taking place that you, you implemented in the past? Well, I think the, the, the first thing was, you know, to stop the screaming. And I mean, I'm being a little dramatic, but I mean, that was part of it. <laughs> um, and it, the, the, the notion of, uh, like we talked about, you know, that, that they were, they, they had to choose themselves a, a, a bit of a growth mindset. And so one of the, the notions we had was uh, the, you know, not being uh, hijacked by your amygdala, not be, you know, not just being reactive and aggressive. And so I think one of the first signs of success, which I promise you, none of us wrote down in any kind of a measure, uh, was that uh, we had introduced the concept of hitting the pause button and uh, taking a breath. And suddenly we, we started seeing supervisors walking around the plants with a big pause button glued to the back of their clipboards so that they could either do it themselves in front of their teams or that the team could actually push the pause button. And while it sounds kind of cute, it actually, it normalized and made everybody feel much more comfortable. And I think it, it was a small indication, but I see one of the questions here, which is how to sell the idea that managers need to be trained as coaches if they don't have the time to do this type of training. I think one of the other aspects of it is we need to be really specific about why, what it, what the cost is if they're not. And however that um, measure is made, whether it's attrition or productivity, I think, I think the why are we doing this as opposed to, and, and how is it going to help me and how is it going to give me more time back, I think is something that we need to be um, telling them as well so that they understand that it in, in fact, in the long run, it will be beneficial to them and their teams. If I could, uh, Jamie, I mean, exactly to that point about the value, right, that one gets from it. I saw that question and that last example that I told you about the, the simulation, in the end, after, it's not just these group 
groups of people who started doing better as people leaders, this group was also the group that tended to raise their hands most often to say, hey, I need that intervention. Hey, I need that. Because they saw themselves in action. They yeah. saw the impact of doing it right or not doing it right. So we personalized that journey to them. So it, it answered mm -hmm. the question of what's in it for me. It's no longer a mandatory program that HR wants you to go through, exactly. but it's an enablement program mm -hmm. that helps me be successful and helps me be, my team be more effective. So I, I love that point, Jamie. Yeah, one of the clients that I worked with last year, and this was one of those organizations that this was their third go, but I think they got it right this third time around. Um, they leaned very, very heavily into creating a strong coaching culture. And, and what we um, designed together was sort of three tiers of coaching. So this sort of fits kind of what you're saying, Adeline, is that there was the manager level, that is what are the expectations as as a people leader and how you're going to coach your people. There was sort of a second tier that was those same individuals that opted in to sort of going deeper as becoming a stronger coach. So sort of opting into development and training, they wanted to go deeper and become stronger as coaches for their people. And then there was a third layer that was sort of professional coaches, sort of leadership coaches that they could tap into, get guidance and support from. And that model I thought was so brilliant. But one of the things we had to do is actually even redefine coaching within the organization because in previous eras that had meant you were on a pip or you were in trouble or there was something going wrong. And so we had to even redefine, well, what does, what does a coach mean? This is about growth and development. It's not about fixing people. And so, um, you know, but I, I really love sort of that three tiers and I have a place to go if I need more help, you know? Yeah. Great. Thank you. I feel like we could continue asking you all questions all day because <laughs> the questions keep coming in, but we've unfortunately got to move on. So, um, so thank you all so much uh, for joining today. Tamra, I'm sure people will be joining your session later on after this session as well. I know I'm keen to, to listen in now. So um, thank you all so much and we'll move on to Bruce. So we'll, we'll say goodbye to all of our, our panelists such a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. We'll move on to, to Bruce now. So some of you will be already be familiar with Bruce. Um, Bruce has done a few different demos for us here in the past. So this is really to, to kind of help give you a visualization of, of how some of these processes could work within a solution like Better Work. So you know, obviously change management is key. We've been discussing that today and lots of helpful tips. Um, and so Bruce will really guide you through how you could leverage a system to really put some of these changes into place. So Bruce, I'll pass over to you. Thanks very much, Amy. To be honest, the first place I'd like to start is, is in amongst what, what often goes wrong. I'm, I'm just thinking about when I'm working away um, and, and trying to build that, that kind of feedback and recognition uh, uh, loop with my colleagues all the time. Um, if I was in a traditional company using a traditional HR tool to record all of my, my uh, feedback and other performance activities, when I have a chat with my colleague like Shep here and I think of something that I need to feed back, I've got to go through that terrible process of trying to remember what tool I need to use. I've then got to think about what my login details were. I've then got to find the right screen to carry out feedback or the right screen to, to carry out the recognition. That might be three or four clicks later. So we're immediately putting a bit of friction. It's actually sounds to me like a little bit too much hard work. So what we do at BetterWorks is we bring that into people's flow of work. We use the tools they're used to, to make these processes easy. So while I'm talking to Shep, I want to give him some recognition. I just click the BetterWorks button and say, recognize via better works immediately it pops up the screen i need to be in allows me to write the recognition which is going to be shared around to everybody immediately the same with the feedback i can give or request feedback from a number of different templates just by clicking that button and choosing the appropriate process so that removal of friction just means that people as well as 
when they are being trained correctly on how to give the feedback, they have a mechanism that allows them to do it, whether they're remotely working with somebody, whether they're doing a reflection after a conversation that they've had with them to make sure that that, that uh, information is recorded and, and accepted by the person they're giving that feedback to, just making it really simple. And if you're not somebody who used um, uh, Teams, you can do the same in Slack, or you can go over to uh, Outlook and carry out the same process. I might be having a nice conversation with one of my colleagues, Robin, here, and when I when I uh, receive the email from Robin afterwards, decide that I want to give some feedback. I, I've called it feed forward today to uh, talk about the forward uh, focus of it. So I can click request or give directly within Outlook here and, and push that through. I can even look at what uh, Robin's currently working on. What are the objectives or goals that Robin is focused on? So really helping me to shape not only feedback, but also in context of Robin's own work by looking at those particular activities that, that uh, she's currently focused on. So really simple tools to use to make that happen. And then when we think about feedback, uh, as, as I've probably said before, I've called it feed forward. I'm really focused at the moment about making sure that when we when we put in place any feed, feedback processes, we help people to, to make use of them in the most productive way. So I'm just gonna give an example here. When, uh, as a manager, I choose to give feed forward, what the, the tool will do is it will give me advice on that process. And Tamara has already highlighted how important it is to make sure you have the right context and the right state of mind when you're carrying out these feedback processes. So here you can see it's actually going to remind the manager that it should be future focused. It should be removal of emotions, accusations and judgment and, and so on. So you can guide the managers to make sure they make the right decisions in that process. You can tie it into your values or competencies to make sure that, again, you're reflecting the way that your business wants to evolve and wants to uh, celebrate successes. And also, you can do things like tie it into other activities. Let's not just give them feedback, but let's maybe suggest that they build a developmental OKR to help them to bridge that feedback gap. Or and maybe we, it's something that you want to discuss as part of training uh, that they should work on or one-to-one. -on -one. So managers are given, a, again, a set of tools that can be very tailored for the organization. Uh, to make sure that they're appropriate because tailoring is really important. We, we know that one of the biggest uh, dangers you can have is trying to treat every employee exactly the same. We need some personalization in our approaches. Uh, in traditional uh, models, you'll often see people having the, the year end review. You'll see them potentially having uh, um, um, check-ins every, every half year or so. As well as having more regular check-ins and lighter weight check-ins uh, um, to, to help people, we also like to empower organizations to empower their managers and employees to carry out the appropriate conversations when it's right for them. So as well as these scheduled activities that, that are set in stone for the various groups of our organization, we then can also allow managers and employees to have these anytime conversations. So when Damon, the employee, decides he wants to discuss his career, then it's uh, automatically built up and, and, and pushed through um, as a conversation between him and his manager. So it's just a very simple way of making sure that that happens. A lot more to our tool. We're very happy to talk in a lot of detail with anybody who's interested. Uh, please get in contact with Amy uh, to find out more details. Thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah, well, thank you all. That was such a great session today, such high levels of interactivity. So it seems you all found it engaging and interesting. I know I learned some things. So appreciate seeing you all and your interactivity. As Bruce said, please do get in touch with us if you would like to see more of the Better Work solution. I know Jamie offered um, conversations with, with anyone on her presentation as well. So we very much welcome seeing you all again in future. And, and thank you to Mihai and team for, for including us again. We'll see you next time.